Josh Penner joins us from the Great American Northwest, where he serves as mayor of the city of Orting, Washington. He is the founder and CEO of Inquisio.ai, an artificial intelligence startup striving to make local government records and policy information more accessible to the public. Josh is also the author of Strategy in 60 Minutes, a book that guides business leaders to develop long-term strategies that ensure their growth in any economic environment. Penner is a veteran of the Iraq War, having served eight years in the United States Marine Corps. In this episode, we will be discussing AI's role in public policy making and local government administration, and spend time talking about leadership in business, the military, and politics, as uh, as well as get Josh's unique perspective on the role of emerging technologies in local governments in the United States. And with that, we welcome Josh to the program. Hey, Brian, thank you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Excellent. Thank you for taking time to speak with us and our audience today. So why don't we begin with uh, your company? Um, I gave a little introduction, but no one can do it justice quite like the founder and CEO. So for the benefit of our audience, tell us a little bit about the genesis of your company uh, and some of the goals that you have around it. You know, I, I think it's fair to say there's a couple of us there, founders, so you can call me a co-founder, but I think the original idea sprang forth from me and, you know, tried to pull a team around myself that could help pull it forward. The, the idea um, came about, I think a little bit from my own school when I was, uh, when I was learning about data mining and machine learning models. Um, and I realized that there was application in the government space, but never was really able to pull together a product that didn't exist in some form in the market. Um, and then, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen just this amazing growth of um, large language models uh, or just generally consumer consumer productization or the beginnings of consumer productization of AI. And uh, it occurred to me that there was a great intersection there. And that's what we're starting to build this company around is the idea that we can we can make government more transparent and easier to access not just for super users of government, you know, folks who have time to engage and understand the lingo of government, but really for anybody in whatever capacity they touch government to be able to access, engage, and meaningfully connect with their own government. And when I say government, I mean, uh, what we call it is small g government. Um, we're familiar with the federal government and states governments, but most people can effectively interact uh, best with their local governments. And this is your cities, counties, school districts, fire districts, and the like. And there's 90,000 of them across the United States. And many of them struggle to be able to respond quickly, efficiently, and accurately to requests for information. And that's the place where we're building products is helping them to engage folks, uh, no matter their education, no matter their language. If they're monolingual, non-English, they should be able to engage with their government. Um, if they're not able to read at a 10th grade level, they should be able to engage with their government and understand what their government's doing. And that's our general guiding philosophy. Can you give an example of something that a local government might face in terms of a request for information, either formally or informally, uh, that's maybe a frequent use case that this particular solution might be helpful with? Sure. Um, you know, we have a constellation of solutions that build towards our ultimate goal. Um, and I think a, an example, something that we're showing folks right now, I just got back from the Association of Washington Cities Conference and was able to talk about ethics and, and AI and how we're going to start framing this policy environment around AI practi practically at the local level and um, a demonstration of the good, because there's certainly plenty of demonstrations of bad, was uh, every, every city has a municipal code and that is the laws of the local community and they're published and there's ways to interact with them, but it's very, the systems for interacting with municipal codes are very poor. Uh, they're keyword based searches. So for instance, if say you live next to a park and you see people constantly uh, with their dogs in the park and no one cleans up after their dogs, you might go to a city website and say, can a dog poop in the park? And I'm using that word poop because that's a common term. However, there is no law in the history of the United States probably that uses the word poop. It probably uses defecation, fecal matter, or some variation thereof, right? So no attorney is going to craft an ordinance that says the word poop in it. Um, and if you search on a government website for can my dog poop in the park, 
you're not going to get a response. You'll get a response for dogs and parks, and you might indirectly get a response for the word poop. Um, and you know, one of the tools that we've developed allows for that context-based searching. I think another example is here in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have a different environment around uh, recreational marijuana usage than other places in the country. You're, you're from uh, the South, right? And you said Dallas? I, yes. I, I'm not sure what the laws are in Dallas. I, I assume ours are uh, more lax around they are. Uh, marijuana usage. <laughs> they are. So if you, for instance, tried to interact with a, a government website or say a, a code book and you, mm-hmm. you said, um, can I grow weeds? Weeds, plural weeds. You know, you're not going to get a response. But uh, using our tool, you'll get back. Well, you know, you can't have overgrown vegetation. But you eliminate that s, and um, can I grow weed? Again, you're not. Nobody in the history of the world has ever written a law that says weed instead of, mar- instead of marijuana or hemp. Um, but our tools can understand that context without additional training, and so. Um, you get just this much, much simpler interaction. I think what's really exciting about the tools that we've built is that it doesn't, it's not just limited to English and vernacular in English. It's, you can ask questions in Spanish and other languages and get back answers in those same languages. Um, and, you know, that's made p- possible by the, the incredible productization of things like uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT and other similar products. I'm not saying that it's driven by that. I'm just saying that similar technology is driving what we're building. And I think a lot of great consumer products are taking, taking the, you know, the idea of being able to interact in natural language and creating some, some wonderful opportunities and, you know, these different industry verticals, whether you're talking the public space or, or, uh, or private, any number of private ventures. And so um, that's, that's one really exciting area that we've, we've been developing part of our solution in. And, um, you know, I think another one is here's a use case is you, uh, you want to add a, you want to add a, a mother-in-law cottage to your home. A lot of people do that, especially in areas where, uh, real estate is really going through the roof, or maybe, you know, we've got an aging population. The average baby boomer turned 65 earlier this year. And so mother-in-law cottages or accessory dwelling units is the term often used in government, um, are becoming very popular and uh and say you want to add one of those to your home and you know that your neighbor added one and a couple a neighbor a couple houses down the street added one and you go to start adding one and you're running into all these issues with permits and you know code enforcement stopping by your house and now you're getting frustrated and so you say oh why is why, why am I running into barriers? And so you start reaching out to your city council or to your city clerk or your city engineer or something like that. And you say, I want to know the history of, I want to know the history of all the different ADUs accepted in this city in the last two years. So it's a very easy request to make. It's something that anyone might make when they're really impassioned about a frustration. The thing is that that also kicks off in most jurisdictions, what in most states, that's an official public records request. Just you speaking that into the air or writing it on a napkin or, you know, sending it into somebody who just started, you know, any form of communication that is basically a request for a record that may exist is an official records request. And if the jurisdiction doesn't respond in a timely way, it opens up a huge world of lawsuits for that jurisdiction. Um, and, so we need some ability to contextually understand when somebody is just throwing it out into the wild and also identify in context those documents that exist within the organization um, and help the, you know, the public records officer or the clerk or whoever in the organization is responsible for that to be able to um, quickly identify those records based off more than just a keyword search um, and uh, to redact, pre-redact those for the pending litigation that may exist and then ultimately produce them. Right now in the city of Seattle, uh, if you make certain records requests, you might get a response back that says it, our, you know, our anticipation is it's going to be 10 years before we're able to fulfill that records request, which seems obscene. But that's the state of records requests at municipalities all across the United States right now. This is the biggest problem you've probably never heard of. Interesting. So let's get into that. It, let's first of all talk about 
You, yeah, I think I got this number right. I wrote it down. You said there are 90,000 local governments throughout the United States. Was that right? Yes. So I assume that these are some of the centers of innovation. Local governments may be able to try things like what you're talking about here with AI tools in a faster, more nimble way than perhaps large bureaucratic, either state government, certainly the federal government. Uh, what is the adoption that you've seen so far, either of the formal solutions that your company offers or even of testing out different variations of AI? Is is this something that many municipalities are actively looking into or are there some barriers here that make it difficult for perhaps the smallest ones to adopt versus maybe larger uh, municipalities with larger budgets? Oh, that's a, there's a really good there's a couple really good nested questions in that question. So, um, you know. I think us at the local level, we we often say we're like a, I don't know, maybe a Petri dish of innovation in this market. Uh, this is where a lot of good ideas can come forward and move fast. Um, you're right in hitting on the bureaucracy of larger governments. Um, you know, if we tried to solve this for the federal government, we'd spend 20 years doing it and billions of dollars and we'd still fail, probably, because there's too many competing interests. At the local level, you can get away with that. Um, we really think the sweet spot for this is probably initially governments of 100,000 constituents or less, which is still 65 to 70 percent of the governments across the United States. So it's still a, a huge portion of that 90,000. Um, it may even be higher than that when we're talking 100,000 citizens. Um, there are definitely communities across the U.S. that are looking at this and seeing, looking at the idea of AI and trying to wrap their minds about how they might utilize it internally. But I think it's also important to realize that the philosophy of business at the local government level is not the same as the philosophy of business, say, in your small business. Um, in your small business, you have a, a much higher tolerance of risk. I, I, that's a massive assumption for those listening to this and maybe for you. But I think when you aggregate it across um, across you know, the population, there's a much higher uh, uh, acceptance of risk for small business than there is for government. Government has uh, a very small tolerance for risk. And that's why when we do investments of money in government, we have to, we have to utilize essentially things that are no risk. It was called uh, risk-free loss, more or less. You know, you're losing money to inflation, but you're not losing money to risk. Um, so our tolerance of risk is very low which means that we often are five, 10 years behind in adoption of typical technology that you would see in the private sector. And that's my own made up statistic, but you know, I, I've been in local government for many years and it's where right now you see maybe in many small to medium sized businesses, tools like Slack or Teams or some way to communicate efficiently outside of a meeting and between meetings. You don't see that at the local level very much in in, uh, in governance, simply because of the public records problem. Every every record generated is a record to be tracked. Um, transparency problems, the risks of things like quorums that could be implied. And so there's this whole bureaucracy of managing a problem and then implementing the solution that is very challenging for local governments to overcome quickly. So they don't innovate very fast. They don't adopt technology very fast. But there are a number of communities that are very interested in our angle of this solution, which is that you don't have to adopt anything. This helps you take what you're already doing and respond to the questions that your public is asking you. Um, and so there's no change in your internal processes except to remove potential barriers or the elements of risk that already exist within your organization. Um, and uh, we have certainly had a lot of interest. There's, I think, no community I've talked to has been uninterested in what we're talking about. There is a, a level of ability to either uh, engage based off who, who we talk to or their particular rules of governance. Or in real practicality, not every government has all their records digitized. And so our tools can't engage with physical paper documents. And so there's going to have to be some up-leveling of their existing business processes before we can even assist them. Um, but, you know, we have, uh, we have communities that are, are very, very interested in what we're doing. And uh, the conversation continues. 
Is there a particular type of government? There are so many local forms of government, including mm-hmm. things down to the school board level, and maybe some municipalities, larger cities actually have smaller units of government, like a park district or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, does it get down to that level of sort of sub sub municipal governments where you might literally be asking for records around the streets and sanitation department of a large city? Or is this really meant for, as you said, the code level of a town, a village, a township, something of that nature? That's uh, so you have background in government or is this uh, (laughs) enough to be conversant? No, that's good. That's good. So uh, you're talking about the sub government level is an excellent way to, to state this is that even within say a municipality, You've got likely uh, different elements. You've got a public safety element, which is probably police and maybe fire. You've got uh, potentially a municipal court element, which is going to be a court system that's overseen by a judge and is largely separated from the bureaucracy of the city government. And then you've got public works and some other potential utility stuff. Um, and then the administration. And each one of those is more is kind of a silo in, in, in itself. Um, you know, the administration ideally is covering all of it, but you know, the court has its own technology. It has its own uh, executive. It has its own clerks and processes. And that can be seen as a sub government within the government that even if the administrative side adopts some of the tools that we're talking about, the court is a whole different beast. And same with police. They're a different beast as well with body camera footage and the, uh, the, the, I would say a very, very much higher level of um, privileged information than probably anywhere else but the court. Uh, Public works is very low level of privileged information, um, similar to administration. And so each one of these different silos has a a different use. Well, not a different use case, but a a different um, implementation case. Um, And they have to be solved for. And then Uh, You have school districts, which are completely, I mean, they're a similar government in in that they have an elected body that's legislative, ostensibly a school board versus a city council, some sort of executive that is usually not elected, a school board uh, superintendent, for instance. Um, So they have a similar kind of government-esque look to them but they are governed by a slightly different set of laws and different expectations around privacy of information. You know, what's privileged and what's not at the uh, city level is different than at the school district. And so each instantiation of these uh, governments has a slightly different rule book that has to be solved for. But, um, you know, it's kind of like if you take baseball versus tennis versus um, versus uh, uh, football, is they're different games, different rules, but there are some basic fundamentals. They all take place on a field and they use a ball. And then you've got to figure out how to perfect your tools for the individual areas. Um, so, uh, you know, that's still in work. I think our sweet spot, we're city people largely that, that founded this um, and some technologists. Our sweet spot is very clearly municipalities. Um, but we also believe that this is effective at... A lot of the problems are faced by uh, school districts, fire districts, and the like throughout the country. So you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I think you were at a conference, and and ethics is a part of the conversation here. Now, the use case that you've laid out here seems fairly benign. You're talking about querying existing municipal codes and ensuring that you're getting easy access to the public or whoever may may need it. But what are some of those ethical considerations that you've had to consider, either with the applications that you have today or maybe some of the things that are in the pipeline for you in the future? Um, There are so many conversations around this at a high level around it its application in business. But in particular, I'm sure that for local governments, it's an even a more uh, acute concern. As you said, the risk tolerance is next to zero. So what are some of those things that you've had to wrestle with or that you and your peers in the company have had to think about as you start rolling out the first versions of your solutions? Well, I'll start with our own challenges in the company. Um, you potentially are engaging with the municipality or a government and there's a lot of privileged information, not because it needs to be a secret, but because maybe it's pending lawsuit or maybe it's somebody's social security number and their employment application. There, There's information that shouldn't be shared publicly. But in order to get context around those documents, 
um, you do need to do some analysis. And so what is the chain of custody of confidentiality in documents or, or in records? And who within an organization that's providing that can access that information? You know, can an, can an intern access it? Can anybody access it? And so there are uh, a number of security concerns for the work that we are, we are building out that need to be understood. And, I, you know, we really feel that this is one of our value added pieces or strategic advantages in this, this industry is that we are aware of at least the confidential nature of many of these documents um, where an outsider may not even realize the, the, you know, the role of litigation in local government. Um, I would say when you start moving outside, just our inside use case, um, the way, the way I, you know, I talk to governments about it, especially at these conferences, when I have an opportunity to speak on ethics and AI and how to AI and governance works is that um, my sincere belief is that AI doesn't necessarily create the ethics issues. It magnifies them. And those ethics issues are the same things that we face ourselves when we're analyzing things on paper is our worldview informs our policy. Um, I'm going to tell a quick story and it's going to seg- it's going to circle back on this. If you don't mind Go ahead. Um, in the city of Ording, uh, uh, silly string and um, and stink bombs are outlawed, according to our ordinance that was written 50, 60, 70 years ago. So in that time, this was clearly a big issue, but you know, cities, states all across the U.S. have these kind of vestigial ordinances that don't make sense. Like you can't drive a black car on Sunday in Denver kind of ordinance. And... Um, when you look at the ordinance and you, it's not just, you can't do this, but ordinances also have like the enforceability and and all that other stuff. When you look at the enforceability clause in the ordinance about who's going to enforce it, it's the chief of police or his designee. He shall be responsible for, uh, for affecting, you know, fines and all that other stuff. It's, it's, if you take that and you read it, it assumes that the chief of police is going to be a man at that date and all days forward. And, um, it's easy to look back and say, oh, you know, they're, they were pig headed or something like that, but you've got to take the data that they had at the time and they established policy based off the data they had. So it's that argument that you got to take things in context. Right now we have a limited data set when we craft policy, even without AI, um, we're trying to build policy. We have a limited data set. We create a policy. And then sometimes, you know, I've been elected for 12 years. Sometimes you look back and go, oh, man, we really got that one wrong. But you've got to move forward and you can adjust in in hindsight. But it it speaks to the bias of data is that um, if the data that you have is biased or your 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 data universe is biased, then the results that you're going to get are biased. And when we're talking about AI, if AI is helping you analyze a problem, helping you uh, craft a solution and helping you perhaps even uh, lobby to get enough votes for your solution, all of the data that it's capturing and it's assisting and how it's magnifying your voice may be magnifying your bias. And that's something that I think policymakers have to be cognizant of. And you can't, you can't effectively regulate against bias, I think, very well. You can try, but... Um, they have to be aware of the ethical implications of uh, not knowing what it is that they're championing. If we cede too much of our ability to understand a problem, craft a solution, lobby for a solution and implement the solution. If we push too much of that off onto this faceless robot, um, there's a huge ethical concern there. Um, It takes the ethical it, what do they call it? It takes the plausible deniability away from you into you were just simply lazy and let something else write it for you and campaign for you. And now we've had this biased implementation and you can't blame you. You're trying to blame the AI for it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the solution to some of this bias is, uh, of course, education, but is making sure that there are intermediaries, that there is ultimately a, I call it the chain of liability, but you know, the buck has to stop with human, um, in the end. So 
uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, I think. Yeah, well, let's take a minute and talk about two particular elements of uh, of the ethical implications of AI. We'll, we'll focus on the municipal governments, but do feel free to take this into the business world as well. Obviously, you've spent a lot of time thinking about this and your company is spending a t- lot of time thinking about this. Um, I, I think you said something earlier that I really want to double click on, which uh, is that AI doesn't create these problems, it amplifies them. And so it's important for you to know those issues going in. What are some of the biggest risk areas that you see that a municipal government's going to potentially run into as they begin implementing an AI solution, whether it's yours or any others? Uh, do you feel like there's going to be more of an issue in the education side of the government, the public safety side, or, or even the routine um, you know, zoning issues? Is there a particular element of government that you think is more prone to some of these ethical concerns than others? Oh, I think... There, it's probably going to, the biggest ethical concern is going to be administrative, but also policy development. Um, so it talked about biased data, but then you start getting into um, feedback loops. And we have that right now in administrative or policy development from an organizational um, strategy perspective of, you've probably always heard the, we've always done it that way, and it hasn't gone wrong. But that's an that's an example of a feedback loop in situ that in in its in it in its stasis mode that's a feedback loop, and then you know you you believe potentially that there's a problem and you're saying we should change how we've always done it somebody and then everybody says we've always done it this way so we're going to keep doing it, and then the problem gets worse and it gets worse and it starts to magnify and so um, that happens in policy um, often it also happens administratively is that. Um, there are processes that um, that can be short circuited just based off personalities versus somebody who uh, you know faithfully fulfills the process. Um, there, the question is, what sort of feedback are you implementing in your solution? Always, uh, whether it's a person, a person that's uh, implementing the solution, or a a machine that's running an algorithm that you have let run the solution. There has to be the opportunity for feedback so that way the um, system and approach can be improved. Um, and, you know, in, in, in government, we want to make sure that that feedback happens at the right speed. It's probably going to happen at a different speed than it can happen in the private sector. Um, and uh, it, I'm trying to think about an example of that. It, in the government, the reason why we don't do a good job at running a business or you know, folks will come up to me and say, you should open up, the city should open a car wash in the city. In the city. We don't have enough car washes or we should have a, we should have a, uh, we should have more daycares. And the response back is that yeah, the city would not run a business very well because every, every issue that, that comes to policy more or less has to be debated for two, three months before anything's passed. And that's, that's rocket fast in policy and, you know, a business, you can make a decision, pull out the credit card and your decisions more or less purchased on credit and it's a risk. And when we talk about the risk tolerance of governments, that's why is that we, we have very little risk tolerance. So our processes are very extended, which means our feedback has to allow for that long extended, uh, changing of course. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the challenges that, AI could potentially speed up an already slow process, but it can only speed it up to the speed of policy uh, passage, which is usually months long, at least. So I think the other component of how local governments may be able to implement and have the ethical element is the involvement of the public. Um, so even who is going to be in charge of teaching these AI systems over time to get smarter, to get better, you, you one would assume that the initial implementation, you go with the information that you have, you probably have some sort of a technology team that's getting the first version of that. But it is government. We are in a democracy. We want the public to have a, a participation in this. 
as you think about the future of the next generations of AI, or even as existing solutions get smarter over time, there will have to be some decisions made about what we plug in and what we don't and what we access and what we don't. How many of those things do you think ultimately can be made by the elected officials, given the authority they have? And then are there going to be decisions along the way where you literally are going to have to put some of these things to a vote because there'll be a public interest and there may be some public controversy over whether you take it in one direction or another? So there is a right now, you know, with uh, open AI and the other large language models, more or less scraping the internet for information to train their models, or at least they did a couple of years ago. There's already an element of pushback saying, um, you know, there, there are businesses and people whose information is online that do not want their stuff scraped. And I think that if there isn't a substantial amount of lawsuits right now, that this is going to be one of the fundamental discussions that occurs in the next couple of years and may end up with lawsuits that go all the way up to the Supreme Court about what right do you have to information to restricting large language models from having information of yours that is online? Um, and what right do they have to scrape information? And um, yeah, I, that is something that Right now, they more or less have whatever you can scrape online, you can throw into the model and whatever method they use, whatever magic they use to train it, they use to train it. Um, in the future, from the big level of many companies trying to figure out what the right to their own data is to not be used by, you know, by these uh, massive data aggregators, down to the local level is what is the right amount of data to allow a system, an AI to have access to. Uh, that stuff has to be sussed out. Um, that's why I believe it's really important for us as a company to engage with policymakers now at the level that we're at. Not just on, we have this awesome whiz bang tool, but also to start wrangling this idea of ethics. So we're we're going to these conferences talking and of course, demonstrating some of the good stuff that we can do. But it's also really important that we start to develop a a skill to be able to discuss the particulars of AI before it, it hits us like a freight train at the local level, um, because it's going to, and it's going to at every single aspect of public facing business. This is a revolutionary change in technology. And um, however much you think it's going to impact us, I think it's going to be uh, many fold more. Um, and uh, you know, I, I guess, I, I can't tell how old you are. It looks like we're at least similar aged. Um, I remember the dot com era in the late nineties, and there was all sorts of dot coms that were never going to make it through. The pet food dot com, but you know it. It was a good idea, but it wasn't the the way that people wanted to buy pet food through all time. Right? We still don't buy food pet food at petfood dot com, but it, we're going to see a big swell of use cases that make no sense in the next couple of years. And maybe our company is one of those. Um, but uh, you're going to see just this amazing throwing spaghetti against the wall for every single use case possible of AI. And a lot of them aren't going to make it through. But while they're not making it through, what's going to happen to all that data? What's going to happen to all that analysis? Um, where petfood.com, you know, if it didn't make it through or toiletpaper.com and it went bust, it went bust. But What's going to happen to all the analysis and the data with all this information that these companies have to it? Like, what's the protection there? So, um, we uh, yeah, we need to we need to make sure that at the you know at the policy making level at all levels that uh, that folks are aware of how to how to ask the right questions. When you think about data, how, how do you think about the ownership of that? There seems to be a public debate about whether my data is mine and I have an ownership to everything from my demographics to my photo to, to where I live. Everything that's associated with me is mine, and I should be the only one to give permission for anybody who wants to query that. And then there are others who say, well, like when you go out on a car on a public road, yes, you're in a private vehicle, but you're on a public road. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off that if you happen to drive by a traffic camera, uh, you know, that particular data at that particular moment is in the public space because you are in the public space. Where do you come down on this idea of the fact that I am online means I have given a certain permission to have my data queried by anybody who can find it versus my data is my data for all time, and only I have the permission to grant it. We are going to have to figure out where that line exists. 
Um, and the way I, the reason I say that as you're giving examples, you know, my, my thought goes to, you know, we shed data, even if we're walking naked through a street, we're shed, shedding data in the form of DNA, right? 40,000 skin cells a, a, a second or something like that are floating off into the, into the void and sharing data with the world of we were there. And if they had the technology to analyze, they can tell us a lot about ourselves just by that, a shocking amount just by that. Um, and so when we shed data into the world, shed information, yeah, well, what is our right to restrict access to that information? How can you practically do so? I don't know. But now, um, you know, they're using brain scans and AI, uh, computers are now starting to be able to regenerate images that brains are imagining. Um, and that's a, that's a newer technology. Now take that technology and run it for 20 or 30 years. You know, can you, instead of shedding DNA in the world, can you shed your thoughts into the world? And so I think my, my, you know, my solace has been, you know, whatever information I put into the world written or, or through my computer in here is mine. But what happens in 20, 30 years when your thoughts are now shed into the world, just like your DNA or just like your musings on Facebook or Twitter? Um, so that's why I say we're going to have to figure out the line to that. And I, you know, that's going to be a heck of a debate. I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, but that line that we create is only going to be for the good guys. Uh, what are the people who are going to be nefarious actors going to do? And um you know, when I when I talk to uh, our our consumers, the governments and stuff, you know, there's a couple different answers. There's the regulatory answer that kind of defines the line. Um, and so we need to define a line. That's a regulatory policy answer. But we also need a practical uh, improvement of technology that can com combat that or can answer that. So we want to live in the public records space, knowing that very easily, if our business fail, we could live in the, you know, the antagonistic public record space. You know, we can make a blast of public records requests to agencies all across the U.S. in multiple languages and drive people in fits and follow that up with lawsuits because, of course, they're unable to respond timely. Um, that is something somebody is going to do. That's going to happen. And so there needs to be, of course, a, a policy line of what is an authentic public record but there needs to also be an equivalent arms race of technology that can respond to it. Um, you can see that with emails and spam bots. You can see that with telephone calls and, and now, you know, likely spam things. And so there's going to be an equivalent arms race for information is what information is yours. That line's going to be drawn and then some sort of way to challenge that from nefarious actors and some way to protect that from, you know, white hat actors. As you look ahead to, and this is now going beyond the scope of your company, so I want to talk about AI more generally. You have a unique perspective and a unique background because you're looking at it from both as an entrepreneur, as the mayor of a town, as well as somebody who served in the military. So you have, I think, a number of perspectives on this. Uh, what is your biggest concern, first of all, about uh, what is not being talked about? either from an ethical standpoint or just from a practical standpoint with AI. Uh, and then the flip side of that will be, where do you see the single biggest opportunity for good? So let's take both extremes. What's your biggest concern on the, the black hat actor side? And what is your greatest hope on the white hat actor side? Yeah, you know, this is, this is a really tough question to answer as far as my biggest concern. Um, I know that there's this concern that AI is going to uh, destroy everybody and maybe it will. Um, and if it, if it is going to, it's already going to, um, I really feel like, you know, Pandora's box is open on this and there's no, no putting, you know, no putting the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. Um, I think my concern is that the, the, the good guys, so to speak, won't, won't adopt good technology and good policies around that technology fast enough to stop the bad guy. So, um, you know, if, if somebody, if somebody invented mail right now, just, you know, good old fashioned U S mail, they invented it right now. It didn't exist until this point. And, uh, somebody realized that mail fraud was a terrific opportunity and nobody had ever heard of it. And they go and they make themselves a couple million dollars. 
it's not going to put things like, you know, the, the, it's not going to put things like nuclear weapons at risk. It's not going to put the existence of humanity at risk. It's not going to uh, put the economy at risk. It's a, it's a small risk in the big scheme of things. Um, the internet and email, you know, it, it, a, a bigger risk, you know, now when things are connected to the internet, there's a risk that they can be, um, you know, taken over. There was, uh, just recently a denial of service attack against, I think, utilities and stuff across the U S by, by possibly Russian hackers, um, or, you know, other state actors. And there's a risk there that exists where if the, the bad guys get some leverage over the good guys, which they do from time to time, it's, it's a big inconvenience and it could go all the way to, uh, spoofing or affecting the economy. There was the AI generated image of, uh, the Pentagon under attack a couple of weeks ago that had like a trillion dollar market swing in 15 minutes. So it's a big inconvenience, but now you're taking that, you're ratcheting it up another level. I think AI, the bad guys having even a one month advantage over the good guys could dramatically change the functioning of the world. And so that I think is one of my, my concerns is uh, the bad actors having too much of a head start on the good actors. Um, and then the other half of your question was what? On the positive side, what are you most optimistic about that AI can unlock for us that uh, can make life better for all of us? In the near term, I think AI is going to enable us to be more productive. Um, and I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. Right. Um, I, it's, it's almost as if everybody has a small staff in their pocket and they can, they adequately using it can magnify their ability to get things done. Uh, decide on your own, whether that's good or bad. If you feel like a, a rat in a wheel, just running even a little bit faster now because of it. Um, I do believe in the medium term, you know, there's, there's been talk about, Things like you know, universal basic income, and I don't know where I'm at on that, but I think it it brings to forward this idea that um, at some point the ability to merge our technologies together, you know, robotics and AI or other things, are going to create environments where the need to produce widgets or spreadsheets is not a that is a that is a production activity whose marginal cost has been driven to zero. So right now you don't do calculations or you don't you don't have rooms of people doing calculations. The marginal cost of a calculation is the photons in your calculator. You know, it's zero. Um, and I think more complex activities, the marginal cost is going to be driven to zero as well. And this may be assembly line activities. I think it's going to go all the way up to a, a lot of knowledge based jobs and white collar based work the marginal cost of those activities are going to be driven to zero in the medium term. And we're talking things like tax preparation, uh, law, some aspects of law anyway, um, just knowledge-based work in the short, medium term. A lot of those activities, marginal cost can be driven to zero, but productivity is going to go up very high. And then you'll start to see actual physical labor stuff product marginal cost go to zero. And we're talking construction, which might sound absolutely outlandish, but if you can merge robotics and AI, why cannot that tool do physical labor? It, it probably can at, at, at a cost, a marginal cost of zero over time. And so you start to see these activities go to zero. And so where does humanity go in that case? I really believe that um, for better or worse, uh, local government is going to be one of those areas that's resistant to um, resistant to total replacement simply because as long as people are getting together, trying to th make things more perfect, there's going to be disagreement and um, people are going to want to disagree. And that's, you know, that that's what city hall is all about. Um, so long-term, I think the good thing is that it's going to open up more opportunity to pursue passions um, absent the, the, the need to, uh, to earn income in, in the same way. Income, I think, is potentially to be redefined in the future. And I'm very much a free market capitalist that, um, that believes, in, believes that uh, 
accomplishing something is something that can raise your self-esteem and ability to, uh, to be happy in life. Um, but I also recognize that, um, the way that we've traditionally accomplished things, uh, you know, education for the purpose of getting a job is not what the future holds. It's education for the purpose of self-development, self-discovery, and maybe, you know, maybe it's going to be, uh, a little bit more egalitarian where, even politics is redefined to that is, you know, that is an exploration of philosophy or something. I, I look forward to it. I'm an optimist of the future. And I, I don't think that people are going to be dismissed of their idea of, um, uh, you know, of the idea that they can go out and build and do something amazing. I think that there may be a, there may be a short circuit of the idea that they need to do that for somebody else. So before we go, I did want to touch a little bit about your path, uh, because we do have a, a lot of young leaders who listen to this program and aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe even aspiring elected officials. And uh, a couple of questions I have for you about how you have navigated being both an entrepreneur and an elected official. Obviously, you served time in the armed forces. Um, what are some of the leadership lessons that you have learned along the way that you would pass on to somebody like yourself 15 years ago, who's maybe thinking about getting into local government, but doesn't really know the way in or doesn't know the ropes yet? Oh, that's, um, I'll, I'll share my thoughts. And if they are true to you, wonderful. Um, if not, there are as many ways to do this as there are people. And I've seen as many ways to do this as I've seen people in my position, um, I didn't come to my position through um, legacy, you know, my um, first generation college, um, first generation master's degree, first generation public servant. Um, and I wasn't a particularly good student initially uh, in college. And I enlisted in the Marines. I was enlisted. I didn't come out of the Marines as an officer, um, but everything I would say the most powerful leadership lessons I learned or at least political leadership lessons I learned, I learned as a Lance Corporal in the Marines. And those that don't know what that means, it means I had no authority, uh, but all the responsibility of getting things done. And so I learned through that leadership opportunity in the Marines to get things done without power, to basically create power through relationships. And that's how you get things done without the ability to say, okay, you have to do it this way because I said so. Um, it, it more comes down to, uh, helping people achieve their needs, um, and making sure that you're able to do it at the same time and achieve your, your needs as well. And so that has been a, a tremendous, um, I think driver of my own success in life was the ideas I learned as a young Marine to figure out how to get things done without authority, but also to nurture young leaders. Um, I don't. A lot of there are a couple different ways people become leaders and good leaders or bad leaders. But in my perspective, um, the moment you're a leader, your job is to figure out how to replace yourself with a young leader that's not in your position. And that could mean pulling people under your wing. But I also think it means engaging with people initially when they enter your organization. And at some point, you're going to get layers of leaders beneath you. And it's not going to be appropriate for you to be in everybody's business um, because then you're you're cutting your own leaders off at the knees. You have to help them engage their their new team members. But um, if you start building your team around you from day one, even before you have the title, even before you have the the ability to you know put it on a business card or something, um, that is going to be what drives you into leadership opportunities. People are going to see that. Um, they're going to see uh, your ability to get things done that others can't, but they're also going to see somebody they want to be around. Um, because you're going to be developing those personal relationship skills at the same time. And so somebody earlier this year asked me, can leaders be, are leaders born or are they made? And I think um, there are aspects of leadership that people are born into. Um, maybe they're great communicators initially, like they're wonderful public speakers, or they just have that gravitas around them where people just want to be around them. And um, that can give you the perception of a great leader. But if they never work on those skills, uh, they're only going to go so far. And somebody who's worked on the skills to be a good leader, who has seen that they are a deficient speaker and sought opportunities to become a better speaker, or seen that they, they lack knowledge and sought opportunities to gain knowledge, 
that person in the end will be a much better leader. So I really believe leaders and uh, we're talking mayors, we're talking government leaders, you're talking business leaders. They are made. You, you, you make yourself a leader um, much more than you ever born into it. And as you look into the future uh, from the perspective of both a business owner and a mayor, what is that next big issue that no one's talking about yet? This can be technology related or not, because we spent much of the podcast speaking about AI. Um, but you always have to be thinking two, three steps ahead. I'm curious what's on your mind these days. What's an issue perhaps that isn't being covered on our national or local newscasts, but you as a local mayor and a business owner, you've been thinking about a lot. Hmm. Um, I think we touched on some of it today probably is, uh, the timing of the future work. So uh, I had a business open in my city yesterday and as part of my, uh, my ribbon cutting speech was um, this idea that as in certain roles, your job is to think day to day and think maybe year to year as you're developing a budget year to year. Um, as a, as a mayor, my, my philosophy is your job is to think decade to decade because uh, the, the policies that you implement like that silly, silly string policy, that's going to be something that still has effect 60, 70 years later, whether it's through the poor language choice or through a, a great insightful policy choice. Um, you have to think decade to decade. Uh, you know, I, I, I really feel that we don't do a good job of thinking decade to decade at any level of politics here, locally, state, nationally. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see see us get better at doing that. And perhaps being able to divorce ourselves a little bit from the need for two and a half people, more or less two people to be working full time and then overtime to raise a family. You know, maybe some implementation of this technology will reduce that stress on the family to where people can start once again, thinking more than day to day and month to month. And I'm not, I'm not punching down on people thinking like that. The, the rat race is how it is right now because people have to. They have to think day to day right now. They don't have a choice um, or week to week, month to month. Um, you know, maybe uh, the massive gains in productivity will create opportunities for people to think longer term about problems that they see all around them from local government to, to their local environment to the future of their city, state, county, and maybe the world. And then my last question uh, is, as you think about all the challenges that you have faced, um, what is the biggest single accomplishment that you've had, either as a business leader or a mayor, that, that you are just super proud of, and it took you some, uh, some tough lessons maybe to get through it, but once you got to the other side, you knew you were a better leader for it? Hmm. Pride is a hard thing for me to express. Um, you know, I, I do sometimes think, holy cow, how, how do I have these opportunities to have people know who I am and engage with them and hopefully solve their problems? You know, um, I've got a, a family who is uh, a big driver in my life and they have, uh, it's, it's not easy. You know, I've got uh, four kids, two of them have significant special needs and, um, you know, the, the, the day to day is a huge challenge to overcome for me. Um, yeah, school wise, I wasn't a great student, but I ended up pushing through and, you know, uh, got was uh, first generation college and then, um, you know, first generation master's degree. And I was really proud of that because I did that while working and, and did both of those degrees while working and was hard. It, it, it took a lot of dedication, but also, you know, when I see these things I'm proud of, I see the sacrifices that others around me have to make to make it happen. When I ran for, when I've run for office, my wife has had to take on extra work as a parent. When I went back to school, my wife had to take on extra work and my kids had to suffer me not being present. And so I have these elements of things I'm really proud of, but they're also mixed with a recognition that it has hurt others or, or created stress in others. Um, being Marine, I, I think I'm proud of the fact that, um, I'm not complacent that I, you know, 
still have the drive, even now when perhaps I don't need it. I, I'm still proud of that fact. If folks would like to learn more about you or your company, uh, do you all have a website that has more information on your AI solutions and technologies? Yeah. Um, Inquisio.ai. So I-N-Q-U-I-S-I-O dot A-I is um, how you can find out more about what we're doing at the local government space. And um, if you want to know more about me, you can find me at LinkedIn. Um, I'm the... I'm the Joshua Penner that is the CEO of Inquisio AI and is the mayor of Boarding. There are other Joshua Penners, and I bet you they're all amazing people. Um, but I'm that one. And I'll give you one last moment because I've never met a mayor who didn't want to plug their city. Uh, I'll give you 60 seconds. Tell us about your city uh, and give us a good reason to uh, maybe spend a little tourism dollars coming by your coming by your way. So uh, city of Ording. yesterday, we opened up Journeyman Grappling. Um, a local family had moved there from the big city, moved here from the big city and, op and opened it up. And um, I had somebody who I was in the Marines with, who's a friend with, um, with the owner came down and said, wow, your city's amazing. There's kids playing in the park, people just sitting on benches, eating ice cream. I never expected I'd see that with the mountain view and the beautiful weather around you. We're surrounded by two rivers. We have nature trail running through us. We're really an oasis out here in the Pacific Northwest, which is a beautiful area of the country. Um, so should you find yourself in the Seattle area looking at Mount Rainier, city of Ording is between you and Mount Rainier. No matter where you're at in Western Washington, city of Ording is between you and the big mountain you see in the distance. Why don't you come on out? Excellent. Josh Penner, thank you for being generous with your time today. And we look forward to perhaps getting a chance to talk to you again in the future. Special thanks again to Josh Penner for taking time to join us. He is a very busy individual. As you heard in the background of that interview, he's got some kids at home and he's got his hands full, as all parents do, uh, raising a family, but also serving as mayor of a town. Small town though it is, but a, a town with all the different stresses, strains, and challenges of, of any other community in America or Ting, Washington. Definitely encourage you all to go. I had not heard of this town before uh, bringing Josh onto the program. I gave him a moment there to promote the community, but I encourage you all take a good look at uh, Orting's website. The pictures are amazing, a very inviting place to go. And if you're going to be in the Seattle area and you'd like to take some time to get out into the communities of Washington State, certainly Orting looks like a beautiful place to go. A uh, town that's been incorporated since the late 1800s, but still has a great small town feel, but with a mayor like uh, Mr. Penner, and with so many of the great residents of that community that are serving alongside him, uh, certainly seems like a very welcoming place. So, um, as, again, special thanks to, to Josh and links to his website and his LinkedIn will be available on the description to this program. I encourage you to go back and listen to this interview again, as I do with all of the shows that are now in our podcast series. We've had some great guests covering a wide range of topics, and some of the topics we get into are really, really quite detailed. So I'm hoping that you have time to go back and listen second, third, fourth time. Every time I go back and listen to these interviews, I pick up on something that even I missed in real time as I was engaged in the conversation. So share with your friends. Listen as a group if you want. I think some of the topics here are even worthy of classroom discussion, if I, if I can be so bold uh, for the teachers out there um, who have college courses or maybe some high school courses, and you'd like to have your kids listen to conversation that might spark a classroom discussion. I think some of what we've done can achieve that. If you would like to listen to any of the episodes, first of all, you can subscribe to this show on any of your favorite podcast platforms, particularly Spotify, iHeartRadio, Odyssey. You can find us on Audible and any number of other uh, podcast aggregators out there. Um, if you aren't yet subscribed, I invite you to do so. If you don't know where to start, start at my website, brianjmatos.com. We have all of our episodes available to stream on the website. All of our episodes and the descriptions and the show notes are available for you there so you can get a good preview for the programs. You can also find us on YouTube at Brian J. Matos Podcast or just search Brian J. Matos in the YouTube search bar. If you want preview clips for this episode or any of the other shows that we have posted and you're not sure if this is going to be the right one for you or not, or maybe you just want a sampling of some of the other content, I would encourage you to visit our YouTube channel, 
catch some of those five to ten minute clips that we've posted, and you'll get a good flavor for some of the great guests that we've had on the program. If you'd like to reach out to me with questions, comments, suggestions for future shows, first of all, you can send me an email, info at brianjmatos.com. That's info at brianjmatos.com. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter and send me messages there, at brianjmatos. Uh, I'm available on Facebook. You can get to my personal page, brian.matos, but I encourage you to find my podcast show page, which I have linked from my personal profile as well, and we post our weekly episodes there. I am available on Instagram, Brian J. Matos, and new uh, for this episode, I am also on threads along with tens of thousands, in fact, now millions of other people who have since joined the platform uh, using the same moniker that I have for Instagram. It's at Brian J. Matos. You can find me on threads. I'll be posting episodes there. Look forward to engaging you, especially those who have been uh, skeptical or not interested in joining Twitter. I think you'll find threads to be a nice alternative. And um, let's preview next week. Richard Hollis is going to be joining us on next week's program. He is the CEO of a company called Risk Crew. It's a London-based cybersecurity risk management consulting firm. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we we had a discussion around the topic of cybersecurity, but in this particular episode next week, we're going to take it in a little bit of a different direction. We are going to talk about cybersecurity, but we're going to talk about the threat landscape, all the different challenges that exist for businesses and governments out there. We're going to take it from the world of government and national security. We're going to talk about uh, private sector risk mitigation. We're even going to get into where we can, the world of weaponized cyber warfare, uh, military applications for cyber weapons. Now, uh, we can't get into all the details because, of course, Richard has various uh, obligations to the governments and the folks that he works with. So we, we get as far into it as we can, and I think you will find this a fascinating conversation, as, as I did, Richard is both a optimist in the sense that that he sees the potential for what can be done to mitigate the threats of the future, but a realist and a real skeptic of some of what we have seen from the risk mitigation community, we'll call it. Um, and I think it's going to be a very eye-opening interview for many of you. It, we covered the basics a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was a very important conversation. So I encourage you to go back and find that episode where we talk a little bit about um, the the threat landscape to individuals, to businesses, to governments, and and how we go about thinking about managing those risks. But but next week is sort of taking it to the next level. And perhaps offering a a different and maybe even a darker view, but a very important one. And so I hope you'll join us next week and download our next episode with Richard Hollis, the CEO of Risk Crew. For now, I thank you all for listening to this episode. Again, I encourage you to subscribe, listen, share, visit my website, engage with us on social media, and most importantly, let's build this community. Share this episode if you found it interesting with your friends, your coworkers, your family members, your community. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but if you don't share, then they're never going to hear and they're never going to know, and we're never going to be able to grow our community. Thank you all for listening, and as always, I invite you all and encourage you all to stay curious. <laughs>